It deals exactly with us today and what we're having to deal with. Ezekiel 33, verse 1, again, I'll paraphrase right now for uh, expedience. Uh, once again, Ezekiel says, a message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, give your people this message. It's actually a warning. He says, when I bring an army against a country, interesting, huh? The people of that land will choose of their own someone to be a watchman, a man to go up on the tower and not survey the up close, but to survey the distant horizon. And when the watchman sees the enemy coming and he sounds the alarm to warn the people, then if those who hear uh, the alarm refuse to take action, it is their own fault if they die. Verse 5, they heard the alarm but ignored it. So the responsibility is theirs. If they had listened to the warning, they could have saved their lives. But if the watchman sees the enemy coming and does not sound the alarm to warn the people, he is responsible for their captivity. They're going to die in their sins, but I will hold the watchman responsible for their deaths. This is exactly the ministry of the pastor. In any culture, historically, from Old Testament to New, from New Testament era of time in Revelation of Scripture to this moment in America, for that matter, in any culture in the world, God's pastors are to blow the trumpet. They're supposed to do it fearlessly. They're supposed to do it without thought of their own lives. They are to warn the body of Christ against dangers coming. And I say that because you may find this interesting. I certainly did. Please listen carefully. Do not misquote me. In light of what's been happening globally in the last six weeks because it's gotten very intense... I have been speaking out about what's happening in the Islamic world and the Middle East and all for a while. I've been speaking out about it a lot since 2007. But I decided a couple of weeks ago that I would pick this Sunday morning to address issues that are increasing and I would use Ezekiel 33 as an example. Why am I telling you this? I normally wouldn't. This last week on Fox News, Bill O'Reilly challenged the pastors of America to step up and to educate and warn their congregations. I sat there as I was preparing for this and I was absolutely dumbfounded. So I want to be very clear to you that I'm not getting my message today from Bill O'Reilly, though I appreciate his challenge. What I'm saying to you is, I was preparing for this, this day was set aside, and it just turn, turns out but, that I believe by the hand of God, now thousands of pastors have decided to set their previously determined message for this Sunday aside, and to pick up and address the issue today of Islam in the world. And I'm grateful for that. And so today, if you're fragile, if you're fragile today, you, need to, you, you might want to go. If you're fragile today, if you're really into political correctness, then you're not going to have a happy day here. Uh, if you like to be deluded and, and, uh, and delusional about what's really happening around, then, then I, I give you fair warning, you need to run for your life. But if you want honest truth, and if you want, listen, listen, if you want the truth, and here's the fun part, I specifically designed today to give you information intending for you not to believe it. I do not want you to believe what I'm saying. Now, psychologists will say, that's an old ploy. It's an old ploy to get people to believe everything you're saying when you say, don't believe a word I'm saying. I'm telling you right now, everything I'm telling you is, it's not secret information. It's all available if you're willing to go look and see. But you must know, as I blow the trumpet, what in the world is going on. So in your note-taking, mark it down. We are talking today about the revival of the Islamic State. What? That's not a new statement. Islamic State? It's 1,400 years old, ladies and gentlemen. Did you know that? 
1,400 years old. We are experiencing today around the world the revival of the Islamic State. And you won't be experts by the end of this service, but you're going to be a lot smarter than you were when you walked in today about world history and about Islam's goals. So number one, I'm going to ask you to remember that we had already planned today when this on the screens happened on Thursday. Put your eyes to the screens. Continuing now with our lead story, The Holy War. Joining us here in New York, Father Gerald Murray, pastor of the Holy Family Church. And from Dallas, Pastor Robert Jeffress, author of the new book, Countdown to the Apocalypse, Why ISIS and Ebola Are Only the Beginning. So, Pastor, begin with you. Why do you think the White House neglected to mention the men beheaded in Libya were Christian? This is a part of a disturbing pattern. This president is continually lecturing us that we're not in a religious war against Islam. And while that's true, it's time for this president to get off of his high horse and acknowledge that radical Islam is in a religious war against us. And until we understand that, we won't understand where this is headed. These Islamists will not rest until they've exterminated every Jew and every Christian from the face of the earth. And if you think that is hyperbole, just listen to what they said on that Libyan beach after they butchered those 21 Christians. They said we are headed to Rome next. And while Rome may be their next stop, I guarantee you it won't be their final stop. They are coming after every one of us as well if we don't stop them now. All right. The president doesn't want to overreact to this crew, ISIS. And behind the scenes, he's telling the American people, look, we're doing what we can to dismantle them. We're bombing them. Uh, we're using drones against terrorists you know we have an active alliance with 60 other nations to fight them so he's not ignoring the threat but he seems to be down playing it and I, I, again I'm not sure why he's doing it do you have the why pastor well, I think uh, part of it is the influence of Islam on his own life. He sees radical Islam as a tiny minority. And while that's true, a powerful minority uh, is much more uh, potent than a passive majority. And I just don't think he can acknowledge this branch of Islam. And I think he's the Neville Chamberlain approach. If we can contain or ignore this threat, it will go away. Okay. Bill, this is not going away. All right, so the Pope, you know, he's not generally uh, an active a political activist, comes out and, and looked to me like he was angry about what happened, as he should be. I mean, these people, they were poor people, Father. These weren't activists yeah. or soldiers or anything like that. Poor people who went from Egypt to Libya to try to make a buck for their family, and they rounded them up and they cut their heads off. I mean, he doesn't get worse than that. So do you believe that the Pope will start to lead in the Holy War? Will he take an active leadership as the secular leaders are, are receding? Well, I think the Pope will continue to say that the West has a duty to protect the innocent and fight this. And we have to recognize martyrdom is when you die for religious reasons. So the Pope is saying quite clearly, uh, ISIS is killing people because they think that's what God wants them to do. The Pope is saying the truth is God does not want this kind of murderous criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, it's up, though, to the leaders with armies, like our president, to get out there and fight them. But I wish he would say that. See, he doesn't say that. I, and again, I'm being unfair to the Pope because it's not his job to, you know, control the world and run the world. But if he would say something like that, Father, can you imagine the headlines? If he would say that America and the West has a moral obligation to neutralize or destroy the jihad. That would be an enormous story, but I don't see him doing that. Well, he did say back uh, in the summer that we have to stop ISIS in reference to what's happening in Iraq and Syria. Mm -hmm. But, you know, let's face it, we don't have to wait for the Pope to tell us what to no, do. No, we don't. And, you know, the don't. United States of America is a moral leader in the world. Where's the moral leadership There here? isn't any. This, this right. is ridiculous. Right. But, but uh, Pastor Jeffers, uh, uh, Father Murray poses an interesting question. Where is the moral leadership? There is no moral well, leadership in the entire world. It's not just Barack Obama. It's Europe. Yeah. It's, you know, there, you know, the king of Jordan got outraged after his guy got burned to death, and he started to do something. The Australian prime minister was outraged after they went to Sydney and gunned down people there. But a cohesive moral leadership does not exist on this earth. And I think that's the theme of your book, is it not? 
It really is. And Bill, I believe in the prophecies of the Bible that things are going to get worse before the Lord returns, but that is no excuse for fatalism. And I believe that Christians ought to be on the forefront of fighting this evil. And this is unmitigated evil, no, no burning people alive. And listen, and that is why I tonight... I am calling on Christians everywhere, Catholics and Protestants together, to join with our Jewish friends and demand that this president do whatever is necessary, including boots on the ground, to eradicate this cancer you know, I think of that's ISIS a good idea. and radical I think, Islam before it destroys us. I think that's a good idea. I think all Christians, Jews, and secularists who love their country and, and yes. want to protect humanity should email and call the White House and say enough. Wouldn't that be a good idea? Would you get behind that? Wouldn't Absolutely. You? Look, uh, we don't maintain a military so they can stay in barracks. We, they're supposed to go out and defend us. People are being killed all the time by ISIS. We get complaints. Uh, I'm very happy that the Egyptians and the Jordanians took some action. We need to take action. Okay, and, and we're not talking about occupation or anything like that. But I'm going to also make a call, gentlemen, and I hope you'll be with me on this, for every cleric in the country next Sunday, Saturday, Friday in the mosques with the imams to address this with their congregation and to say enough that we people of good faith have to tell our leader to get in gear. I'd like to see That's every right. cleric in this country do that. Do you guys agree? I'm going to talk about what, it. Pastor, you, you, you going to agree? All right, let's let's make that happen. And I want every okay. pastor, every priest, every rabbi, and every imam to email me personally and tell me you're going to do that. And I'll read as many on the air as I can. Gentlemen, thanks very much. I did email Bill O'Reilly and I told him thank you for picking up my talking points and doing the program on Thursday. Um, again, I just, I'm just going to ask you this morning to pay maybe a little bit closer attention, not because I'm up here or because you're there, but because maybe God wants to say something. If he uses, for example, Fox News in this particular segment to announce to America's pastors to say something, and this particular church already had this day planned, that just maybe we ought to pay attention to what we're about to hear. Number one thing, keep this in mind. Yes, thank God, the Pope is uh, getting stirred up and the Catholics are getting very concerned. Especially in the light of the last few days. Why? Because ISIS has declared with their victory in Libya and Algeria that they would now be heading to Rome. They're going to be attacking Rome, says ISIS. They are now, as of this morning, 500 miles from Rome. What's going on in the world? What is happening? And I want to ask you this question today. Why is Islam desiring to attack Italy, for that matter? Why is Islam outside of its Arabian Peninsula? I'm just asking you that question. Where was Islam born? In the peninsula of what is today Saudi Arabia. I want you to be thinking about that for a moment. It's relatively new on the block some 1,400 years ago. It follows Judaism. It follows Christianity. The Bible was intact. And then comes Islam. I want to ask you a question. I want you to be thinking. And I want you to be careful not to get your education from any news service, including Fox, CNN, and certainly not from your high school or university campus. It's absolutely a shame. So I want you to be thinking today, and I want you to be a very, very bright and educated people about what we're looking at. Mark it down in your notes, first of all, that when we hear the term or the word radical Islam, radical Islam, you've all heard that. I want you to know the reason why you've all heard that is because it is a uniquely Western American creation. Did you know that? Prior to the Bush administration, there was no such terminology of radical Muslim or radical Islam. Did you know that? It was invented by us, we, the West. Why? Because it felt better for us to uh, divide a group of people based upon the talking points that we were hearing from the Muslim community. Those are radicals. Those are radicals. So we would look at the word radical. If you do a, uh, a, a really a dissection or the pathology of the origin of the word radical, its beginnings comes out of the word root. A root, or the root. For example, uh, there's orange trees on campus. If you want to have a really, really healthy, strong orange come from an orange tree, you want to make sure that you get the vitamins down to the roots. 
If the roots are strong, it means it will be the most authentic orange tree producing oranges possible. Are you with me? When you go to the roots, you are known to be going to the source. When you say, let's get to the root of the matter. What are you saying when you do that? We want to get to the source of the matter. Are we not saying that? Do you understand that? So when we say radical Muslim or radical uh, Islam, what are we saying? We are saying source Islam, source Muslim. Pure Muslim, pure Islam. That's what the word means. But our administration would have you believe that, don't worry, there's a crazy fringe out there called extremists. They're not even radical Muslims. Our administration will not use the term radical Muslims or radical Islam together. Now, if you're a Muslim this morning and you're here right now, you may not agree with me publicly, but you'll have to agree with me privately. Islam is not a religion. Does that come to shock to you? Islam has a religious aspect to it. Islam has a military aspect to it. Islam has a social aspect to it. Islam has a judicial branch to it called Sharia. Islam has an educational system of it. Islam has all of these various ribs that prop up the umbrella of a world dominated by the Arabic meaning of the word Islam. Contrary, I just saw it the other day, a spokesperson for the uh, Council Care, the Council for American Islamic Relations said to the American public, light straight through her teeth, she said, the word Islam means peace. The word Islam means submit. (laughs) But you know what? If we're not thinking, if we're not researching for ourselves, if we're busy watching uh, the Kardashians uh, and uh, the Rams play the goats, we won't know what's going on. But we need to know the truth because, listen, ladies and gentlemen, the world has changed. Under our noses, it's changed. It will never go back to being the same. Because the toothpaste is out of the tube. Or in this case, the jihad has gone global. This is not my opinion. And so Rome meets to gather its military forces and political leaders to figure out on Thursday night, what are they going to do about the Islamic threat that is promised to invade Rome? Why are they concerned, ladies and gentlemen? Because they've invaded Rome before. They know their history. And it's coming again. I want to ask you, think, why is it coming again?